I'm Ed Jaffe and welcome to JaffeWoodwinds.com. Uh, today we're uh, going to have one of the great uh, alto saxophonists, great flute doublers uh, with us, the uh, wonderful Jerry Dodgen. And Jerry is our third artist in this Woodwind Legacy series. Um, many of you may know that Jerry grew up in the Bay Area and was uh, very popular with leaders there, played with people such as Gerald Wilson and Vernon Alley, and in fact, uh, in the mid-1950s with Vernon Alley's quartet backed up Billy Holiday. Uh, eventually, in the late 50s, he joined Red Norvo's quintet, uh, which was very uh, helpful in Jerry uh, touring the country and also backing up acts and working for people such as Frank Sinatra and Benny Goodman. Uh, by the early 60s, uh, Jerry moved to New York and at that time uh, started to uh, become known uh, not only in the jazz world but also in the recording scene. And uh, over the last 60 years, Jerry probably has played and recorded with more uh, great artists and diverse artists than maybe anyone in the industry, from Louis Armstrong uh, right through Herbie Hancock. Uh, it's an amazing career. And uh, just to give you an idea, I'm going to need to read this because there's just so many uh, bands that Jerry played with. Jerry's been a member of some of the greatest big bands in history, including Count Basie, Duke Pearson, Quincy Jones, Oliver Nelson, Tad Dameron, Toshiko Akiyoshi, Frank West, Grover Mitchell, Ron Carter, and some of the organizational big bands, the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra, Smithsonian Jazz Orchestra, Carnegie Hall Jazz Orchestra and the American Jazz Orchestra. And of course, most of us n know Jerry as the wonderful saxophonist, original member of the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra. Uh, in addition, uh, Jerry's recorded with numerous people in small group situations, including Donald Byrd, Red Norvo, Louis Armstrong, as I mentioned, Stanley Turrentine, Blue Mitchell, Lou Donaldson, Charlie Mingus, Clark Terry, Charlie Mariano, uh, just to name a few. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, my friend and someone who I've admired for many decades, Jerry Dodgen. Jerry, thanks for being here today. I oh, appreciate it very much. Thank you. It's nice to be here. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we'll be able to share some of your insights into the music world and into a career that has been uh, over 60 years now. You're, if you don't mind me saying, an octogenarian. <laughs> That's right, of course. And yeah. uh, that alone and being so active and still passionate about music is something I think very special. In fact, right after we do the interview, you're headed down for a rehearsal uh, to play in a rehearsal band. So yeah. I guess my question initially is, how have you maintained your love, your enthusiasm, your passion for playing and your good health all these years? I mean, it's something that we don't often uh, see in the jazz world and in the commercial world, but you stand alone in that way, really. Well, I'm going to have to say I'm very lucky because, uh, you know, people ask me, how was how is it that you were able to do all these things? I, I said, well, I was very lucky, and then they don't want to take that for an answer. They say, what did you bring with you when you came to New York? And well, well and I had lots of help. I had... Uh, See, I'm not very aggressive. I, I, I was never aggressive enough to call somebody and ask for a job, ever. And the, and the guys I play with, look, if you need work, so just, there's nothing wrong with calling up somebody and telling them you're available. I said, well, it's okay for somebody else. I just I didn't ever, you know. But it turned out I really didn't have to. Because I was surrounded by people who were aggressive, they were aggressive for me. Right. I mean, no kidding. It's it, so. I, and that that area is kind of. I just put it. I chalk it up to luck, being at the right place at the right time, and lucky, and 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 really, uh, a lot of help from really a lot of people, really great people and uh, great fine musicians, and uh, you know they recommend teachers and. Uh, and it was just, and I had great teachers, you know, I was just... Uh, well, who were some of the people you grew up with in the Bay Area who you may have studied with, or who influenced you in a sort of a mentor well, way? Well, in the Bay Area, my, my jazz life really started when I played with Gerald Wilson. And he came to live there for about two years. And uh, he started the band there. And... Uh, and I remember going in, and I sat between Jerome Richardson was the lead alto player, 
and Teddy Edwards was the jazz tenor player on the right, and I sat between them, <clears throat> and the band was warming up, and it sounded just like a junior high school band warms up, you know? And Gerald <laughs> stepped in front of the band, and he wanted to say something. He didn't raise his voice. He said, and all of a sudden it got quiet. It was totally quiet. I thought, wow, here's some respect. This, this is, I'm learning something. This is not like the motion picture whiplash that we're seeing today. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> well, and, and it was a music lesson from then on. I mean, it, 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 he was so respected, and rightfully so, you know. My God. At that time, and that was in 53, he was, had already played with uh, Jimmy Lunsford and uh, Benny Carter and... Uh, uh, Count Basie and Duke Ellington and arrangements for Count Basie and for Duke Ellington and I mean he had a history that was unbelievable and as I was just finding out about but all the guys in the band they knew this <laughs> and when he wanted to say something it get so quiet it was it was just great it was really and it turned out he was one of my mentors actually later too so I you know I uh, I, I just really fortunate to be at the right time, and and my love for music was the only thing I, I could bring to it, you know, because I, I really loved the music. And uh, right. was alto your first instrument? Actually, yeah, I I started in beginning band in junior high school. And who 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 were some of the alto sax players that you sort of looked up to or idolized as a young player? Well, it took a while before I got to that level to even. Uh, um, uh, I, I remember uh, uh, one of my early mentors was a trumpet player, three years older than me, named John Coppola, and uh, he he had play, was playing with bands. He'd go out and play with bands and come back. He'd go out with Charlie Barnett or somebody, and he'd come back and we'd have a rehearsal or something, and he would say, "Now you guys are doing this all wrong." Says. Uh, the guys in New York are doing this. They're talking about the time is so important. And uh, the, of course, the dynamics are important, but the time is the most important. So, and, and the thing, you know, and, and it was just little things that he would talk about all the time that became, a, uh, for me, I, you know, I looked up to him so much, and uh, he was always right. <laughs> and uh, it, there's, one of the great ways to learn is to do something wrong. You know, you really, that sticks with you. you, yeah. know, you, you know, when you when you repair that, that really that hangs in there. It's good. Yeah. You, sure. you know, it's, you know, if you're just lucky on something the first time, you don't learn anything. You learn when you make a mistake. You know, right. especially as a young musician. Sure. That's, right. That, uh, and and when did some of your other woodwinds, like flute, uh, come into play? Because you know, many people may not know this, but uh, Jerry's. It was really one of the best jazz flute players we had, and I, I, if you don't mind me recommending two recordings that you made, one with Donald Byrd on an album called Fancy Free, and on the title track, Jerry played a beautiful uh, flute solo, and on Herbie Hancock's Speak Like a Child, uh, another beautiful uh, flute solo and some lovely alto flute playing. Um, so, I mean, you, you, you've done a lot of uh, flute playing in your life, and certainly as part of the Thad Mel uh, orchestra. Thad wrote some beautiful uh, tunes with woodwind doublings, and and as one of the alto players, you mm. always would play flute on that. Uh, where did you develop your love for uh, the doubles and and you know your expertise on them? Well, uh, I guess I, when I started rehearsing with uh, Gerald Wilson, I noticed Jerome was already a fine flute player, and uh, he'd been studying with one of the guys in the San Francisco Symphony. And uh, well, I wasn't I wasn't anywhere near that, but I, I my interest was always piqued about that stuff, you know. So I was uh, I just I would you know find about a good teacher and try you know to, for a little while and uh, learn a little more and get more experience. And I I um, I really got a lot of experience. I got some really good experience before leaving the Bay Area. I mean, uh, uh, Gerald Wilson was unbelievable, and uh, 
Did he write for flute or and clarinet in his arrangements quite a bit well, at that yeah, time? Just a little bit, but not 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 extensively at that time. Later on, he became uh, more adept at that stuff. But uh, um, I, you know, I, I in the little bands I would play in and stuff, there was, there was always everything was challenging to me, you know. So every and everything was a a learning experience. So I mean, it's just. Uh, Let me at it, you know. <laughs> it's right. really fun and really right. enjoyable, and and uh, I, I kept getting more experience, you know, just a little more at a time. And uh, when Red Norvo called, and th th this was a, at that time, I was playing in a, a little group, playing a jam session uh, place outside of uh, San Mateo, which is down by the airport in San Francisco. And uh, Sunday afternoons, you know, and I was playing a slow blues and uh, with my eyes closed, and I just come to my end of my solo. I have before I open my eyes, I I hear another alto start to play. It was a, a shock, and it, and it, and it was Charlie Mariano, and he was in San Francisco with Shelley Mann and this man then, and he and Russ Freeman had come down to. Uh, I don't, I don't know how they found our place and why they came there. I don't know that at all. But uh, then we played two or three tunes together, and a, a couple of weeks later, uh, Russ Freeman called me. He said, "Say we're doing an album with with uh, Charlie Mariano in L.A." He said, "Would you like to come down and do it?" I said, "Sure." Uh, uh, what is it? And he said, "Well, these days, you know, you have to have a, a gimmick to get a record, <laughs> which is." Uh, and you still do. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And, the, and, and, so, and this was 1957. Yeah. So it, uh, I said, what's the gimmick? He says, they're all World War I songs. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> Can you send me the music, please? He said, oh, yeah, I'll send you the music. Charlie wrote all the arrangements for two altos, vibes, piano, bass, and drums. And... Uh, and a high level, I mean, it's Shelley Mann and uh, M Monty Budwig and Jimmy Rolls and uh, Victor Feldman and Charlie and me. And, uh, I, you know, I did my best to keep up with him. He, he was great, great alto player and he was a great writer. He was, every, he was just a total musician. Man. And uh, I remember there was a one song that I played the flute on. It was kind of... An early attempt, and uh, he'd written a, a part for him on the recorder, and I played the flute. <laughs> and we, we were just listening to the playback of that, and uh, and I see in the I see Shorty Rogers come into the control room. Now I know who he is. I don't know him, but I know who he is. And uh, all these guys, you know, they were listening to the playback, and they will run in to say hello to him. You know, I said, well. I don't know. It's okay. I, I I got lots of music to work on here. And then, uh, maybe four or five weeks later, I get a call from Red Norvo. He says, uh, "Say he says uh, Frank Sinatra has got us uh, getting us a gig in the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas to play with the quintet, and uh, for six weeks. Would you like to do it?" And I said, "Sure." It just sounds good to me, you know. And, he's, and we'd talk about it and agree on everything. And he said, uh, I said, wait a minute. You and I have never met. How come you're calling me? And he said, uh, my brother-in-law told me to call you. I said, who's your brother-in-law? <laughs> he said, Shorty Rogers. He said, he <laughs> called Shorty. He said, listen, I need an alto player who plays a little flute. And he said, why don't you get that guy from San Francisco? And, and Red says, what's his name? He says, I don't know. <laughs> so then if, if Red hadn't taken the time right. to, to, to call the other guys that were on the record date, I, I, who knows? You know? Well, that's sometimes the way things happen in life and certainly in the oh, music yeah. business. I mean, you just never know who's going to be hearing you yeah. and, and in what point that person might be a, uh, able to help you. And you, you can't plan on any of no. this stuff. This is just... Uh, it, and so, uh, so we do the record, and it was not my playing on the record made anything. The record didn't come out for a year. 
you know. So, right. and, uh, but uh, then we started in Las Vegas with the uh, quintet, which is uh, uh, no piano, it's vibes, right. guitar, bass, and drums, and me, and. Uh, we we got a little repertoire going, and I, he, Red played some of my tunes, and I played some of their tunes. I said it was it was, it was a pre, pre, presentable group, you know. And uh, we do little television shows from L.A. now and then. We we go in and we do uh, spots on the Dinah Shore show, maybe four or five of those, and uh, Steve Allen stuff like that, and. Uh, <laughs> So then, then, uh, then Frank Sinatra would come in now and then because I think he might have been part owner of the Sands at that time. I don't know, but, but he, he was on the scene. He would come into the lounge and we were playing, you know, and listen to us and stuff. And then, uh, then Red says, uh, uh, Frank wants us to play for him. I said, uh oh. <laughs> and uh, here, here we, so then Bill Miller, his piano player, uh, uh, got the scores of all the uh, the, uh, the famous uh, songs that Frank did. You know that the people recognized the arrangement, the uh, you know at least the timing of the arrangement the, and everything. Right. And uh, um, then we rehearsed, we re rehearsed his his. Uh, Place in Coldwater Canyon. I remember it was sort of Japanese uh, uh, kind of a house, you know. And uh, <laughs> the, the the fires the the fire was a fire in the fireplace. He's he's stoking the fire. He's wearing a smoking jacket, and uh, he's singing the verse to uh, "Foggy Day." And I'm thinking, how did I get here? <laughs> Unbelievable! It was it was really. I mean, you talk about a learning experience. It's just unbelievable. You know, who who would think about that? And and all of this started from what you're putting. If we're putting the chronology together, from just being doing a record date, taking yeah. care of business on the date, and Shorty Rogers happened to notice that, and obviously liked what you did, what he heard in the playback. I guess so. And and one thing led to another, to another, to yeah. another. I stayed with Red Norville three years, it almost. Exactly three years, and uh, I, I, would, I call that my music school because I learned so much in that time. You know, and not just in playing in the quintet; mm -hmm. that was that was good in itself. <clears throat> but then the, the other stuff, you know, playing with Frank Sinatra and playing with uh, with Benny Goodman, it brought other things into the picture. You know, and, and uh, I would. Yeah. I, I was loving every minute of it. Everything was a learning experience that preceded another learning experience. I mean, uh, it was, none of this was planned. It was timing. Right. You know, <clears throat> there was a lot of work then. There was a record industry there and that stuff. So <clears throat> when I told Red I wasn't going to leave and uh, uh, stay in New York, he said, okay. He said, well, good luck and everything. And, uh, <clears throat> and, then when we, when, and then the next night he says, don't run off too fast. He says, <clears throat> we're closing here next week with Benny, but then Errol Garner's coming in for two weeks, and they want two pianist groups to play opposite him, and they had the Kenny, Kenny Burrell Trio and Red Norville Quintet play opposite him. and." Uh, and, uh, and he did something I couldn't understand. I didn't, you, you know, you don't see the whole picture a lot of times. And yet, he, was, he had me make the announcements, uh, <laughs> introduce the guys in the band and stuff. Now, he'd never done that before. What's he doing? I don't know. I can't, I can't figure it out. So, so then uh, finally, uh, Eric Garner's thing finishes and the, and that was that was a great experience too. It was amazing. And also the first time, first couple of times we played at Basin Street East, Bill Evans Trio was playing opposite. It was very. It was what a trip. It was just great. So, <laughs> uh, what a, what a great. Exp I mean, 
to be in an environment of all of these great musicians oh, and yeah. different styles of musicians oh, and, yeah. and at a time that they were themselves searching and, and growing and uh, evolving oh, yeah. their styles. It must Unbe have been unbelievable. It, yeah, unbelievable is right. And, and then I, when I, I called Jerome and I said, okay, I'm here and I'm, I'm staying here. He says, okay, give me your phone number. <clears throat> and it wasn't right away, but a little later he calls. He said, what are you doing Thursday night? I said, nothing. He said, would you like a record date? I said, sure. He says, uh, bell sound at 11 o'clock at night. I said, that's strange. So I get an alto sax, nothing else. I get there and it's uh, Quincy Jones <laughs> with, with Dinah Washington. And all my heroes are in the band. I mean, I remember the trumpets. Uh, Ernie Royal, Clark Terry, Joe Newman, and Joe Wilder. Wow. And, and <laughs> that was just my first record date in New York. And I thought, gee, there's no place to go but down, you know? <laughs> and uh, uh, and it, it, I had no idea that uh, I was going to get to be personal friends of all these guys for 50 years. I had no idea that. You know, there's no you know way you can see that. No, and nobody's promising that. No, it's not even mentioned. It's not, you know. But, uh, <clears throat> that, well, I, yeah, I, I've always been appreciative of, of stuff that happens, you know. And I never, I didn't have, I didn't have to develop an, uh, an aggressiveness to, to uh, get ahead. It seemed I, I just had to practice and get good because who knows where the next call is coming from, you know, and, and they're always challenging and stuff. But there's something, I think, that comes through, and, and, and from knowing you, I, I believe it to be true, uh, no matter how wonderful a player you are, to have a 60-plus year career, successful, and, uh, and as you are, and you, know, you must understand that uh, many generations of musicians uh, not only respect you, but revere you and really enjoy your company, that you yourself uh, exude a positive vibe and a, and a, uh, a love for uh, playing music and being around musicians. And I think that's an important lesson that all of us uh, can learn from, and that uh, young players, uh, perhaps uh, watching this video, might consider uh, that th the way you act among your colleagues, the way you feel about music, does come through. And ultimately, uh, that will stay in people's memory and uh, will, you yeah. know, make a difference in one's career. Well, you know, all my experiences were, were all positive. I didn't have, I know many talented people that didn't have the 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 timing or whatever the, you know and had bad experiences and discouraging experiences and stuff uh, it seemed like all my experiences were were learning situations to go to the next one you know? but you made them as learning experiences i would guess mm -hmm. jerry i mean some people could just take them as gigs take the money and run type of thing but it sounds mm -hmm. like you really try to use them as uh stepping stones to increasing your you know Musical knowledge. I had lots of help, really. And Jerome, Jerome did a lot more than that. He got me all kinds of other things. He, he'd have me sub for him, in in little. He had a, he had a. A Thursday night, dance gig, for uh, Scandinavian Airlines at a small, club in New York. <clears throat> and, uh, I'd, I'd show up. He said, uh, I can't. I'm going to be later. I can't make this. So you go and do it. And I said, okay. And I go in, and Richard Wyans is the piano player who I knew from San Francisco. I played with him with Vernon Alley. And it's just, it was great. And Grady Tate was the drummer. And uh, just great experience. And just, um, just, you know, one after another. I, You know, <clears throat> we'll, we'll, uh, Friedwall referred to me once as the, uh, the, the vastly experienced Mr. Dodger. <laughs> and, and I thought, that was, that, I thought that's really humorous. That's really good. And then the more I thought of it, I thought, gee, you know, he's right. Now what do I do? You know? <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, man. 
Well, you know, uh, but it's sort of like, a, 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 it's you know, some things in life happen for a reason. And I think if you present yourself and genuinely feel uh, grateful for being in a situation well, and that, treat it that, that way, which you obviously did. I, I had no problem with humility. Right. <laughs> but that, I think people, people are attracted to that. And I think that's a trait that, you know, uh, is worth mentioning and, you know, keeping in mind when we are working. Uh, let me let me jump ahead a little bit. You're, when, now you're in New York, and uh, Thad and Mel are, are beginning to form their band, and obviously Jerome probably had a great deal as well as Thad to getting you situated in the sax section in that original uh, well, you saxophone know, group. Well, you know, actually, um, I, I knew Thad and Mel separately, I, and I knew Mel because I'd just done well, not just, but. A year or so before, I, Mel came in to do Peggy Lee. I, I played for Peggy Lee at Basin Street East quite a bit. Oh, that's what I was going to say, because, you know, I couldn't figure what Red Norville was having me make the, well, the announcements, the announcements yeah. in Basin Street East. Then the lady who was doing the uh, hiring in, for the musicians in Basin Street East was Phoebe Jacobs. And then I had no idea that, that she was going to be important in my life, and she kept calling me for these things, calling me to play with Peggy Lee there, and then that one thing led, led to another. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, You know, when it, the work was falling off and stuff, I didn't know what to do. To, you know, <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> so the best thing I could do was to go to Jim and Andy's or one of these... See, there, there was such a music, live music scene happening in New York at the time. There were five bars that catered to musicians. And Jim and Andy's just musicians. I mean, if people come, when he comes in off the street, he would tell them, you know, probably, you're probably looking for another place. You know? <laughs> I, I, I'm, unbelievable. Yeah. And guys would bring their instruments in and leave them for a day or two. and. and, and and uh, you could and run a tab, you could eat if you're starving, and you could run a tab. And, Unbelievable. And the studio was just r above it, too. Oh, yeah, right. the, the one on 848th Street. 848th Street, yeah. right, they would call down. And that's where, uh, that's where we had our first rehearsal with that and Mel. Now, uh, one of the things I, I observed over the years in Thad and Mel's uh, orchestra uh, in regard to the sax section, is that gen generally speaking, it seemed like the sax is played with less vibrato and sometimes no vibrato, which was ra a radically different thing than we heard, for instance, in the Basie band or yeah. the Ellington bands, yeah. or, a, or a lot of the bands, yeah. uh, well into the 60s. Uh, was that a conscious uh, decision among the saxophones, or was it Jerome's call as the initial I lead think I, I, I just, you know, I... As I remember, Jerome was just, he had his way of playing things, and we all did it the way he did it. And, that's, and then uh, when I took over, I, I kept the same phrasing in a lot of the stuff. I did, said, no, I, you know, no reason to change it. Right, you know? and I think Dick, when Dick Oates took over for you, I think he certainly maintained that same integrity oh, and, so, and yeah. uh, tradition. And that, with that music, sure. Right. So it was not a, uh, anything stated or say we're, gonna, no. we're not going to play vibrato in this no. band. We're going to. This no. is just the way Jerome yeah. felt it and interpreted it. And uh, as far as saxophone section playing, you know, I, I ended up playing a lot of lead in different different situations, and people ask me, "Well, how do you do it?" I, <laughs> I said, "I, you know, I'm not very aggressive, and I don't." I don't think telling somebody how to play is going to really work, you know. So, I always tell them just listen. You know, listening is it, that's it's so it, it's one of the most important things when you play music is learning to listen. Now, whenever it starts, you know, uh, for me it started list uh, maybe in my I was fourteen or fifteen trying trying to figure out you got to look at this note you're playing here. And that's that's with this trombone behind you and a trumpet over there, and uh, <laughs> and it's soft, and right after it's a loud note, and and uh, how you, you I don't know I don't know how to tell anybody how to listen. Right. You just have to say listen, and everybody has their own way of listening. So. Uh, okay. 
You know, well, I, you, well I, 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 was, I, was, I was sort of taught that uh, when you play in a section, you, you play with the, the lead, whoever's playing the lead, and you phrase the same way and try to breathe in the same places and make sure your volume was, is not, uh, you know, taking it out of context or something, you know, and, and to play together. And, and there, uh, that's, that's one of the things I, I did know about a little bit from my early mentor, John Coppola. Mm -hmm. he th it was a, a section playing and ensemble playing. And, and you have to listen, listen for the drums, listen for the, listen for these, all these things. Just, but but if, you, if you say, uh, I want to tell you something now, and you run down this list, nobody's going to be, <laughs> 10 minutes later, you tell them, tell them how to listen. Nobody's going to get it. You know? Right. So, right. But, but the Thad Mel Orchestra, I think, especially the, the, uh, the original band, uh, certainly, uh, and that was the first, as I've expressed to you, the first great big band that I ever experienced in a live situation. Uh, the section playing was so spectacular. Uh, the blend, I mean, it, there yeah. wasn't anything one could possibly uh, say, well, it's, this well, is a little short. This, well, it was just yeah. wonderful. Uh, well, it was, wasn't a young band. I mean, I was the third youngest guy in the band, and I was 33. You know, Daddy Daniels was 23. Right. And um, Joe Farrell was uh, maybe two years younger than me. The rest of the guys were older and were experienced. I mean, so the lead players were really experienced. Because I remember the first rehearsal. And it was, Thad had never heard it either, you know. <laughs> he counted it off and the band would hit. And I said, wow, this is really something, man. And he was, he was, he was unbelievable. I always, uh, you know, I, uh, when I used to hear him play with the Basie band, when uh, Frank Foster and Frank West were in the band. And, right. uh, You're talking about that now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and Thad and Joe Newman were the trumpet solos. And Joe Newman played great. He, it really was play, just was great swing and uh, expression and spirit. And then Thad, when he would improvise, he could do, he played the same rhythmic stuff. He had that all together, but his melodies were always different. And I was trying to figure them out, you know, I could figure it. And uh, I, I told myself, I didn't tell anybody else. I said to myself, I said, I hope I get good enough to play with him someday. No, that's a, that's a like a, you know, eighteen year old alto player saying something to himself. You know, right. it's that when when I got the call to play in the band, the very first rehearsal, I said, "Would you be interested?" I said, "Certainly, I wouldn't miss it for anything." <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh man, and uh, Thad was just he, he he could write so beautifully, he could play so beautifully, and never play the same way twice. On a true improviser, I mean, he, his his improvising knew no no boundaries. You know, I mean, uh, bar lines or key signatures, he could play any note, and it was great. And, and when I when I would try to improvise, I remember I'd I'd, I'd end up on a major third in a minor chord or something. You know. And it's, that's about as bad as you can get. But when he would play a major third and a minor chord, it was music. He made music <laughs> out of it. And I thought, wow, I'm, like, I'm learning something here. Unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, uh, all of that still being said, uh, it was also, and with the great uh, leaders in the Thad Mel band, the great section leaders, Nonetheless, uh, that original sax section did rehearse those charts. You oh, guys yeah. did get, and, and this is something I think for, um, some young bands and players who might be listening who are in college bands, uh, that you guys took it upon yourself to rehearse. This wasn't oh, yeah. something that Thad and Mel said, hey, you guys have to rehearse. You guys took it upon yourself to rehearse this, this music, which was all new to you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how did that come about? I mean, who was, who, was it Jerome saying, hey, yeah, we've oh, got to sure. get together? And it was Jerome. He says, say, uh, what are you guys doing Wednesday afternoon? Uh, you know, you want to come over to my place and we'll go through some of this stuff, you know? And especially, 
when when uh, Thad wrote the arrangement on Groove Merchant, which was Jerome's song, right. and he wrote this beautiful saxophone chord. One of the best sax solis ever. Yeah, it's, it's great. phenomenal. And then, uh, you know, after a while, we got so we, we, you know, we memorized it and we stand up and play it, you know, and uh, then Thad started playing it with us. And I think he, you know, he was so musical, he could do that. He, he heard us playing, so he could just play along with us. Double the soprano part. Double the lead part. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and mentioning Groove Merchant, it makes me think back to the beautiful dynamics that the sax section played mm -hmm. that solely with, beginning that solely and the way it crafted it and, and shaped it. Uh, it was not just, just five saxophones playing the notes correctly in time. Uh, there was more to it than that. I should mention this. I don't want to do it. let this go by. In those days, uh, there was no amplified bass. There was no amplifiers on the stand. So the bass players were both, whoever they were, were acoustic. And uh, Now this was 1966, 67, yeah. and this is certainly after the Beatles and, and yeah. rock and roll was certainly uh, as popular oh, yeah. uh, then uh, as it was ever. And, and uh, amplifiers were a big thing. So you, uh, Thad Mel still kept to the acoustical premise. Yes, and, uh, and with acoustic bass, saxophone solis are great. With amplified bass, and then and I, then I started seeing the effects of that. When the, the amplified bass was too loud, the band leaders were always saying, I can't hear the saxes. So then pretty soon that even the writers stopped writing saxophone solos. Interesting. They write unisons and solos. I said, what is this? And it was when the, the bass became so prominent that it was sort of, it was changing the music. Really strange, huh? That, that's very interesting. And that's something that uh, whenever I get a chance to see uh, uh, young saxophone players who want to play so solely or something like that, I, I, I try to find out if there's acoustic bass around and, and so that they can get, play it once with acoustic bass. Right. And then you'll know how comfortable it can be to play some of this music because the music was created. See, all those bands for years, all through the 30s and 40s, there was no amplified bass. Right. Right. And a lot of times, the in, uh, in uh, vocal arrangements, sometimes there'd be the most beautiful saxophone writing would be in the backgrounds, like you know the Tommy Dorsey and all those bands. You know they had some really beautiful saxophone stuff to play. Sure. And then, uh, but uh, for a young musician, if you, you got to have the experience of playing that kind, if you're going to play that music with the uh, for four and five saxophones is avoid the amplified bass if you can. And then, you know, and then, but it, it depends on who's playing the bass too, see. Right. With the Duke Pearson's band, Bob, Bob Cranshaw played Fender bass, but it was never a problem. Now when anybody else played the Fender bass, it was always too loud and that, he was sensitive. Well, because he, he played both acoustic and Fender yeah, and yeah. both exceedingly well. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. Let me ask you, with all your experience in big band playing, you've played second alto and you've played lead alto. How do you change your approach, uh, maybe equipment-wise or even psychologically, when you're playing second as compared to lead? I mean, do you make some uh, specific equipment changes uh, to do that, uh, or is it more a uh, no. just a, a mental approach to the Sure. No, I, 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 equipment changes for, I don't think are really necessary if, uh, if, uh, if you get a, you have a, a mouthpiece and a reed that work, you don't want to take that off and put on something else. I mean, it, because you're already, you're playing in, you're playing in balance with where you're sitting and uh, it, it works. I, that's what Frank West used to say. Uh, in uh, ensemble playing, think of playing in balance. Now, that helped guys who were not such great ensemble players to, to 
try and stay in line better and stuff. They, they, you know, there's different ways people would say these things. Right. They, and they, some, sometimes they're saying them to one person, you know. But right. I mean, they're, they're diplomatic about it. Right, right. <laughs> well, that, look, uh, that's uh, always the axiom, whether it be playing in a sax section, whether it be playing in a, a musical theater orchestra, yeah. whether it's playing in a, co a concert orchestra. Sure. It, it's that same musicianship that has to come through. Oh, yeah. Um, you've played in small group situations and obviously many big band situations. Uh, what would you say the advantage, uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to be uh, specific about this, what's the advantages of playing in a big band in developing one's ability to then perhaps, uh, you know, play in small groups? Is, is there a carryover that you can talk about? Well, I remember uh, Art Farmer once said it's, it's it, that big bands are good because a lot of people, not everybody, can play in small groups. And some of the people that play in big bands then can get a peep at that and get a little taste of it and, and incorporate it into their stuff. You know, but, uh, right. but that's that's taken for granted that the big, big bands are headed this way or, or this way, and you can't say that now. You know? Right. And so it's... Uh, oh. Right. I mean, how did the big, your extensive big band uh, experience influence, uh, you know, your improvising, let's say, that you, you know, would be perhaps more showcased than even small groups? Well, for me, I, I was always considered myself more of a blues player than a, than a, a you know, complicated uh, harmonic player. So, but uh, and uh, Thad used to. Uh, there was one song we did called Backbone, and at the very first rehearsal, he said, uh, uh, "Dodge, I want you, to, you just start playing the blues and see at this tempo." I said, by myself? He said, yeah. So so I'm playing by myself, and I don't, pretty soon he brings the bass in, maybe, and the drums, maybe the piano. And then you cut them all out, and I'm still by myself again, you know. And trying to, you know, you learn you have to keep your place in this. You never know what's going to happen, you know. So, and uh, every time we uh, we played this song, uh, a lot of times I got lucky on it, I really, and, uh, but uh, I got two of my greatest compliments when we played that song. Well, now one, one of them was, uh, we, we just sat down for the second set, sitting next to Jerome in Cannonball, and sitting at the first table right here in between us. And uh, uh, that says, let's play number six. And I said, oh, shh. <laughs> and, and, and Jerome just cracked up. And, ah, ha, ha. And so, so, you know, and that was, that's a learning experience. To, cannonball is sitting right there, and you're going to and you're going to play the blues. And you're going to play by yourself for a while. <laughs> yeah. so, so, but I, 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 um, I, I guess I, Earned some self confidence along the way because uh, I was, I, I felt it was easier to play in front of the greatest musicians than it was to play in front of my peers. You know, my peers are saying, What do you did that? So they're criticizing. When the great musicians, if they, it's something they like, it's, you know, <laughs> if they don't like it, but the uh, and then Joe Zalvano kept coming in to hear the band. He said, oh, he said, Cannonball talks about you all the time, man. I thought, oh, boy. boy. <laughs> and then another time we were playing, and, and uh, after the, the piece is over, Thad says, stand up and take a bow, you know. So, and I said, take a bow, and as I'm just starting to sit down, I hear this voice back by the third trombone says, hey, you. Hey, you alto player. I said, yeah. He says, hey, you keep doing that stuff, I'm going to have to go home and get my horn. And it was Coleman Hawkins. <laughs> and, and Jerome says to me, he says, do you have any idea what a great compliment that is? And I said, uh, yes, I do. 
what do I do now? And, and, and I cracked him up. I cracked him. Jerome was good. I could get him to laugh. Was, oh, man. But it, it's timing, and uh, I, you know, I, it, it, it's, it, life is a learning experience. It's part of the whole thing. You know, yeah. it's, all, it's all in the same, it's all in the same song, I guess. Yeah. Now you've uh, you're still active doing a few rehearsal bands, two or three rehearsal bands in town. Uh, what are you looking to do at this point? Are you, do you have any goals as far as maybe doing another record? Or you well, you, it, uh, you recently released in the last several years yeah. a wonderful album called "The Joy of Sax" uh, with a saxophone section and rhythm section and featuring many of your tunes as well. Uh, wonderful uh, album, Jerry. Are, are you looking to do anything along that line again, or you know, what? I'd like to do. Well, I just have to do it, I guess. I, because I, uh, I'd like to, you know, get a trio or quartet and play, you know, uh, one or two nights a week. I would love that. But I, I, it seems to be pretty hard to do. That's what everybody wants to do, and no, not many people are doing it. Right, and, and, and the clubs are being are very difficult. The few clubs that have oh. that type of policy, yeah. uh, you have to you have to run through a you know run through a closed door to try to try to get that. It seems, uh, yeah, at least in is, New York. Well, it, I I think it's a little late for me to become aggressive now. You so think? I, so I, I think <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to do it my way and see if, see if it works. Yeah. I've got to give it a try. Anyway, there's a couple of clubs that they. I've been asked to uh, bring groups in, so I'll, uh, you know, I just, it's hard to get started when you have not been playing all the time. It's, it's really feels strange when you get up to a point when you're playing all the time, you're ready for anything. You know, the phone rings, come down and play, and I say, okay. You don't say, oh, I gotta get a read or I gotta practice, yeah, it's too late. Right. You do it. But if you played the day before and the day before that, come on, you, you're okay. You just do it, you know. Right. But, um, Who are the young um, saxophone players or, or doublers or so forth that uh, have impressed you in recent years that, you know, you, re you really, uh, you know, find inspiring? Oh, well, there's a couple alto players I've enjoyed lately, but I, I, don't, I don't think they're into doubling. Um, Jameel Washington... He played with uh, Roy Haynes's group, and every time I heard him, he, he sounded better, and I got to play with him with uh, um, Benny Wallace. And uh, another guy who was really promising, is he's really doing great, is uh, Godwin Lewis. And yes. uh, he, he's really amazing, it's great. And see, these guys, they have a future ahead of them, is that, but it's not, it's not uh, orchestrally or uh, playing with larger groups. They're soloists, you know. Right. And that's so they're working on their stuff to to do that as long as they can, I guess. But uh, you know, it's a, it's really hard to come up with an answer when to your question really about what is the how, what does a young musician prepare himself for now? You know. Right. I mean, uh, some of the things that I um, I tried to express certainly when I was teaching uh, in a university was uh, that you know you have to prepare yourself for anything and and that if you really love playing for instance woodwinds if you love playing the flute or the clarinet oboe or bassoon do it uh, because it can only help you uh, if you're really sincere about it and passionate it can only help you in, in not only in music but also in, in, in getting some work, uh, but also about in writing and arranging. And certainly you've, mm -hmm. you've done some wonderful writing uh, and arranging over the years. Um, I wanted mm -hmm. to talk to you about your writing uh, process, your compositional <laughs> process, because well, I know you've told me you're the world's slowest composer. <laughs> oh, oh, certainly. But, uh, <laughs> but Thad, in, Thad did encourage me to write. No. Yeah, I remember one night we were just... Uh, we're just finishing the first set in the Vanguard. And the band stands up, takes a bow, and we're sitting down. And Thad leans over to me and he says, uh, Dodge, he says, uh, meet me in the kitchen. I want to talk to you about something. I said, okay. 
and then it took a long time to get in the kitchen in those days. Like, crap, there were so many people, and every table you walk by, they get a compliment you for the music and the band and everything, and they have questions. And, and I, as, as I got closer to the kitchen, I started second guessing. I said, wait a minute. Uh, there was no sparkle in his eye. There was no, you know, he's deadly serious. Uh, I'm wondering if now I started to get paranoid. Did I, <laughs> is, have I broken some musical rule, uh, yeah. some uh, huge uh, glaring thing I'm doing wrong? And he's going to let me know. You know, I'm, I'm preparing myself for a, uh, <laughs> at least a criticism, you know. And, uh, and I walk in and he's waiting for me. And he says, Dodge, he says, I want you to get your pen out and write something for the band. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was uh, totally uh, uh, at the same time uh, elated and uh, relieved at the same time. And I, said, I, think, wait, and I said, wait a minute, uh, you're writing for the band, and Brookmeyer's writing for the band, and Tom McIntosh and, and Garnett Brown are writing for the band. The, I mean, I, I'm almost a beginner. You want me to start writing for the band now? He says, yeah. He says, get your pen out. He was serious. So, uh, you know, but I was, it took me a year to do my first arrangement, I think, you know. Or, you know and, was, that th was that the tune, Thank You? No, that was, uh, the first one was, uh, Come On Over My Love. It was, and it was a, a ballad, you know, sort of, Vanilla type ballad with a little bit of ensemble in it, and then um, and Snooky Young playing the solo, and he played it so beautifully. <laughs> he, he, I said, he said, Jerry, I'm getting a lot of compliments on your song. I said, Well, I, that's because the way you're playing it, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, and uh, it was just, it was uh, really anyway. And then, um, oh, I guess Thank You was. Uh, that was one of my fastest ones. It only took me about three months. And that's what, just that's what, seven minutes long or something? Yeah. Like well, that. just to make it easier for you to accept that, you know, Chopin was renowned for being meticulous mm -hmm. and uh, about every note that he wrote, and there were stories of him going into a room and 10, 12 hours later coming out with one page. Well, so it's not bad company. Oh, okay. Well, that's that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I mean, you wrote extensively for your album, The Joy of Sax, on it, and well, you had a lot of nice, wonderful tunes and arrangements. Well, uh, it's fun to do that, you know. It was, it was another learning experience. And, of course, having Frank Wess in, in the section was great. Not a, not, not a bad tenor player to have. Oh, my so. God. And, uh, <laughs> and also a great writer himself, so. Yes. It was... Uh, so, I mean, is there, is, is there a process that you have evolved now over the years since you've been writing now for many years? Hmm. No, I, I don't have a process. I, I, uh, I sort of go by the seat of my pants, I guess. If, if, I, if I find a melody I like, then, uh, you know, when I go to sleep at night, I think about it until I'm asleep, you know. So, I, so maybe by morning, maybe there's something in it. But it's not right. mine, it's whatever right. happens. Uh, well, you know? okay. Yeah. All right, so it, it goes in that direction. But uh, it, it's a, I like the story of Benny Golson when he, he said he was, uh, you know, he's a great jazz composer. He's got lots of compositions. And, and he said one night he woke up with this melody. He says, I got oh I got to I got to write this down. He's and he, he runs into the piano and he 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 writes it down. He says, "Oh man, I'm glad I did that." And he got, went back to bed and he woke up the next morning. And said, "Oh, I want to go see my piece and see what it man. I knew that's something that I, that's something really special. I got was getting a message, you know." <laughs> and he looked at it and he says, "Oh my God!" He says. Uh, I've just written the verse to Stardust. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's, oh, I love that. You know, and he's such a beautiful, beautiful and, person. And, he, you know, and, and a great composer great, as well oh, as a yes. great sax player. Oh, yes. yes. You know. <laughs> With depth, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, Jerry, I know we're going to, I'd love to 
have everyone listen to you play uh, a little bit uh, as part, wrapping up our session today. Uh, you still play so beautifully and yeah, uh, so personally. Uh, and, and that may be, maybe after all is said and done, the thing that uh, may have carried your career and, and many other people's that when you play, it is you are playing uh, Jerry Dodgen. And uh, you're not playing Bird, you're not playing Cannonball, you're not playing Charlie Marilyn, you're playing your, uh, you know, yourself. And, and, and maybe that's what that's what it really amounts to ultimately in music. Well, I, maybe I was lucky. I was never good enough to copy anybody. <laughs> well, no, so come I, on. I'm stuck with playing, you know, playing myself. It's, it's, it's okay. Well, I think you did pretty well. Oh, thank you. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> okay. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, we hope you'll come back uh, to the Woodwind Legacy series on joffeywoodwinds.com. Our Next installment will feature the wonderful flute player, renowned teacher, Keith Underwood. Oh Thanks for attending, and uh, look forward to seeing you. Thank uh-huh.